Well, good morning, folks, and welcome to our service here at Nairn Free Church for Sunday the 4th of October. Uh, we do give you a warm welcome in the name of Jesus and do pray that wherever you are and whoever you are, you'll be blessed and enriched as we gather in his presence today for worship. Um, we are conscious that some folk are tuning in for the first time, others may be here um, many times before, but whoever we are, wherever we are, our prayer is that God would be with us and that we would hear his voice speaking to us as we worship together. We're going to begin our service singing to his praise in Psalm 139. Uh, this is a, a theme that's kept coming up as we've been exploring the book of Jonah. Uh, it's, it's that psalm that reminds us that uh, as Jonah knew full well, you can't actually get away from the presence of God. He thought he could, perhaps, but he couldn't. And uh, the Lord is with his people everywhere. And uh, it's that wonderful psalm that speaks of wherever we are, whatever we're up to, God knows us and knows our location and knows our hearts better than we ever could ourselves. So we sing to his praise, O Lord, thou hast me searched and known, thou knowest my sitting down and rising up, yea, all my thoughts afar to thee are known. Uh, we sing along with folks from the Free Church Samadhi Recital and we sing to God's praise. We turn to God in prayer. Let's pray. 
Almighty God, how great and wonderful God in heaven. There is no hiding from you. There is nowhere we can go that you cannot follow, uh, let alone be there before us. Uh, all the world is known and exposed to you. Our very hearts, our very thoughts are known to you. You see everything we do. You hear everything we say. You know everything we think. And from one end of the globe to the other, uh, we are always in your presence. Lord, there, there's such a comfort about that for your people. Such a, a wonder to know that we are never beyond your care and your provision and your grace and your love. And yet at the same time, it can be so threatening for others who think and wish they could get away from God, away from the challenge of your word, away from the, the claims of your word, the, away from the commands of your word that tell us uh, how we ought to live and how we ought to fear God and how we ought to live in the light of your word. We pray that you would help us not to be so foolish as to think that we can ever outrun God or outwit God. Help us uh, to know that you are the God who is gracious and kind uh, to those whom you love and who you have set your love upon and that this is the, the best and the safest place in the universe to be is within your arms and within your grace. Help us, Lord, to run to you as Jonah eventually would and not run away from you as he started off doing. We do ask that you would enable us to seek to know you better and to, to know your word better that that word would take root in our hearts and that it would grow and that it would make us to be more and more Christ-like as time goes by. We feel ashamed how sinful we are, uh, how long it takes us to learn even the simplest lessons, that things we should have known years ago, mistakes we still keep making, uh, errors we still fall into, sins we still commit in spite of many years on the road. We pray, Lord, your forgiveness and your grace and we thank you that with you there is forgiveness. Uh, there is perfect redemption to be found in Christ. And we thank and praise you most of all for him, our precious Saviour, who shed his blood in order that we might be saved. Enable us to turn to him afresh and to seek to serve him all the days of our life. And we pray, continue to be with us as we wait upon you in your word once again, as we study it together as we look to see what you would have to say to us, uh, give us the desire to know the word of God and to follow wherever it is you will lead us. We pray for our troubled world, uh, both the, the world on our doorstep uh, locally and the world all around us internationally. Uh, we're conscious again of the this virus that sweeps the world and is changing so many lives in so many places and we see how it affects not just uh, humble folk and folk that are vulnerable but even the the strong and the mighty and the powerful and uh, our own leaders our own prime minister has suffered from it we see the president of the united states suffering from it lord we're rem reminded that all of us are but mortals all of us are just men and women and children uh, and made in the image of God and uh, vulnerable and prone to anything that the people of this earth are prone to. We pray for your grace to be in President Trump and his wife at this time. We pray that uh, they would be uh, preserved and kept safe. And we pray that all this would help him, help them, help the nation, help uh, us as a world to be more prayerful, to be more humble, to recognise ourselves as always been simply in the hands of God, in whose hands uh, is the, the very breath in our lungs, the, the very beating of our heart, the very, the, the very blood coursing around our veins. Lord, we are entirely dependent upon your grace, just as surely as even the, the smallest of creaturely life is, the, the birds, the insects, the animals. Lord, everyone depends on you for their life, for their existence. And we pray, help us to see that while people are far more precious than these things, uh, nevertheless, uh, we are frail, we are mortal. We are creatures that are here today, gone tomorrow. 
we pass through this life so swiftly. Uh, but you are the God who is forever, the God who is the same yesterday and today and forever, the God who is unchanging, the God who is ageless and timeless, the God who is beyond time and space, the God who has created time and space, the, the God who upholds everything by the word of his power. We pray enable us to come to you, recognising our weakness and our frailty and committing ourselves to you once and again. We do pray for folks known to us who are going through hard times and be near to them and hear our prayers we ask on their behalf. Remember those who, who mourn, uphold them and strengthen them and comfort them as only you can. And for those who are unwell and who have great needs in their lives, in their family life, in their working life, in their home life, Lord, whatever it is, Lord, we pray, enable us to bring our cares and our troubles and our worries to you and to know that you are the God who cares for us. May your spirit be poured out upon us. May we find hope in your gospel. We are so conscious of the, the gloominess that can be around, the despair that can be around, the uh, sadness, the discouragement, the depression that can be around. Lord, we pray that the light of your word would shine into the the lives of men and women and boys and girls and show them the, the better way and the life that is abundant and is always to be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. May all that we do be done for his glory and praise. May we know him in our lives. If we are seeking him, may we find him. If we know him, may we know him better. May we be found faithful and true servants of Jesus in whose name we ask everything with the forgiveness of our every sin. Amen. Well, we're going to, to read now in God's Word. We're going to read again from the book of Jonah and um, just remind ourselves how uh, Jonah had been thrown overboard and gets swallowed by a great fish, as it describes here, or a great sea creature, as uh, we've seen in previous weeks. So uh, we're going to read from chapter 1, verse 17, uh, through the whole of chapter 2 and finish at chapter 2, verse 10. So Kirsty will read this for us. And for the most part, it's Jonah's prayer from inside the belly of the creature. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish, saying, I called out to the Lord out of my distress, and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. For you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the flood surrounded me. All your waves and your billows passed over me. Then I said, I am driven away from your sight, yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to take my life. The deep surrounded me. Weeds were wrapped about my head at the roots of the mountains. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you, into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. But I, with the voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. Amen. Well, we'll turn then uh, this morning to look at uh, this passage in the book of Jonah, uh, obviously a very central passage, and um, we began to look at aspects of it last week. We saw how uh, Jonah was indeed swallowed by this great sea creature, whatever it was, uh, but how he still prayed to the Lord his God from inside the, the belly of the fish. And uh, today perhaps we'll look more at the, the content of that prayer and things that we can learn from it. Um, you might remember that uh, last week we made reference to Richard Coken, who described the the sea creature, the, the whale, whatever it was, as like a, a living submarine. And uh, so, so it was, it was the, the submarine that would transport Jonah safely back to, to land. Uh, he also, at another point, talks about it as being God's ambulance 
taking this unconscious patient uh, from a place of danger to a place of safety. And uh, both these illustrations, I, I like them both, they're, they're, they're very graphic examples of what is going on here. Uh, Jonah ought to be drowning in the sea and instead he's brought safely back to land in the most peculiar and unique fashion. And I guess it is a pretty unique story. It could be in the Guinness Book of Records almost because for all we know, others have been swallowed by creatures um, and may even have prayed before they died. Um, but I'm not sure anybody ever survived to tell the tale the way that Jonah survives to tell the tale. Far less write a book about it. This book that we've got recorded here, his life has turned inside out um, by the, the power of God. And he himself uh, goes in this passage from being inside the, the, the beast until at the end of the chapter, he is vomited out on the, the dry land. Um, so his life is turned inside out and he himself literally goes from the inside out. And we see that inside the, the creature's belly, Jonah prays a prayer to the Lord his God. That's one of the things we focused on last week. Prayed to the Lord his God from the belly of the fish. Out of the, the belly of Sheol, he says in, in verse 2, I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he answered me. Out of the belly of Sheol I cried and you heard my voice. Folk that are not so familiar with the Bible uh, probably won't know this word. They, they may look at it and think, is, is that a name for a whale? Is that like Moby Dick? Is it that kind of thing out of the belly of this creature? Uh, no, the, the word Sheol is a Hebrew word that refers to, to death. It can be hell. It can be the grave. It, 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 it can be the realm of the dead. It's the realm of the dead and with, without reference necessarily to whether that's heaven or hell, it's, it's the place where the dead go. And uh, perhaps Old Testament folks had a, a less clear idea of heaven and hell than is revealed to us in the New Testament, particularly by Jesus himself. And uh, what Jonah is saying is here, I, I was in the jaws of death. I was at the very gates of death and I cried out to the Lord to save me from this realm of the dead. And he's, he's praying. And... You, you could say, well, this might be his prayer before he died. You could say, if, as we saw theologically last week, it's possible that maybe he did die and was resurrected, how that would tie in with the gospel picture of this um, being a, a reflection of Jesus rising from the dead. Uh, it could be the prayer uh, that he, he, he prays uh, either at the beginning or the end of this experience. Um, but the point is that he prays. He prays and he prays quite consciously. And the fact is he is alive at this point uh, that he prays. Whenever that comes within the three days and three nights, uh, he's alive. He's not been bitten in half as he gets swallowed by this creature. He's, he's not chewed up. He's not digested. He doesn't dissolve or get absorbed into the body of the, the creature. He is miraculously preserved by God. This is Ultimately, it's a great story of preservation and a story of the goodness and the grace of God. He's a trophy of grace, a living example of God's utterly undeserved grace toward those that simply do not deserve it. Because not only does he pray to God, but God answers him. That, that's, that's really astonishing, isn't it, when you stop and think about it? Out of the belly of Sheol I cried, and you heard my voice. Lots of people pray. Does God hear them? He, we're promised he hears us if we pray in the name of Jesus. People of all sorts pray. We know the men on the ship prayed um, to their gods who were utterly powerless to help. Uh, people pray all the time, but here's a man who, who prays and the Lord hears him. That's a, a wonderful truth. It's great to have a, a wonderful experience of God, which ultimately this is what it's going to be for Jonah. It's a wonderful experience of God's grace. You can imagine in days to come when he looks back on it and he's, he must be just filled with wonder at what the Lord's done for him all the time. 
But that's the point, isn't it? He, he remembers. It's greatest not it's greatest still not just to have an experience of God's grace, but to remember it. Not to forget it, not to deny it. He he might might he have been tempted in days to come to pretend he never had such a shameful episode in his life, trying to run away from God, uh, refusing to do the job God's given him, not caring that the city of Nineveh is not going to hear the gospel and post potentially be saved. He could be so ashamed of this chapter of his life that he chooses to black it out from his memory and chooses never to tell anybody about it. And yet clearly that's not the case. He has this amazing experience of deliverance and he not only remembers it, he writes it down or he gets somebody else to write it down in order that the story might be preserved, all under the influence of God, of course, under the influence of the Holy Spirit. But on a human level, Jonah records this story for us and doesn't forget what the Lord has done. He retells it. He shares the story and it becomes an encouragement, doesn't it? What a story to tell his grandchildren, if there were ever such people. What a story to tell the people of God, the church of his own day, to be able to say, this is what the Lord has done. And here we are, 3,000 years later, still remembering the same story, still remembering the grace of God towards this runaway prophet, the grace of God towards this wicked city, the grace of God toward these uh, pagan sailors, the grace of God, the same then as it is today, the same God who calls sinners to himself, the same God who is still saving and delivering in the, the present day. It's an encouragement and if the world goes on another 3,000 years or 300,000 years, whatever it is, uh, the story will still be told and the, the, the goodness and the grace of God will still be exalted. How important it is to still be telling the stories of God's goodness to us. And it should just be a reminder to us, as we've seen before, cry out to God anywhere, anytime, whatever circumstances you're in, cry out to him because he's not just the God that we can pray to, he's the God who hears and answers when we call in the name of Jesus. Jonah didn't know the name Jesus, didn't know the Messiah that was to come, knew the promises that were there for his people, trusting in the God who would send that Messiah and be the salvation of his people. And he cries out to that covenant, gracious, loving God, and he's remarkably delivered. Pray to God. Don't, don't not Pray to God, whatever your situation, whatever your circumstances, find your hope, find your help, find your salvation in the same God that Jonah turned to. But it's interesting too, here's another thing as, as we move on, uh, it's interesting to what he prays as he's drowning. And as we follow through uh, these 10 verses of chapter 2, uh, where is his mind at? as this uh, awful experience is unfolding for him. It's intriguing that virtually everything he says in this prayer is from the book of Psalms. Almost every phrase as you go through this can be found in the, in the book of Psalms. Uh, there's references, there's themes uh, connecting to Psalm 18, Psalm 130. Uh, I haven't got time for these references other than to tell you them. Psalm 130, 143, 40, Psalm 118, Psalm 120, Psalm 34, Psalm 139, Psalm 42, 88, 69, 31. You can pick up themes from these Psalms uh, coming out in Jonah's prayer at this time. And we have to ask, well, what's that about? Is that deliberate? Is this uh, Jonah feeling I'm dying here, I better start quoting scripture in order to ingratiate myself with God, to kind of curry favour with God, to show that uh, at the last minute um, I was trying to think godly thoughts. Is that where it's going? Is that what Joan is doing? Sometimes we hear folk like that in their desperation, in, in a crisis, in an emergency moment, and they start saying their rosary or chanting the Lord's Prayer or trying to think of something spiritual just in case this is the end and they, they would find themselves not ready. Is, is that what Jonah's doing here? 
that he's, he's just desperately trying to regurgitate some uh, long distant memories uh, from his childhood or something of prayers and godly songs that he once knew. I don't think it is. I don't think it is that at all. I think there's something much deeper going on here with Jonah. Uh, you could be at the, the prayer meeting and you, you'll hear uh, the men and women there praying for um, and using words of scripture to inform their prayers. Uh, the, the, the word of God is, is there in their hearts and it comes out in their mind and when we pray we remember phrases from scripture, we remember verses of scripture and we, we turn these into prayers to God and, and I think that's what's going on here with Jonah. He's recalling God's word that's there in his heart and in his soul. He he has spent his lifetime, because remember he, prior to running away from God here, he's a, he's a godly man that the Lord has used as a prophet and is going to use again as a prophet. And ultimately he's a godly man, a servant of, of the Lord. And I believe that that knowledge is stored in his head and it's it comes out and the Bible is there in his head and it comes out at this moment as his heart and soul cries out to God and he's remembering some of the great things, some of the great words, some of the great promises that God has made to his people. And that becomes the substance of what's on his his heart and his mind, even at this um, horrendous time for him. What a wonderful thing to have scripture loaded in your heart. You, your word I have hidden in my heart, says the psalmist, that I might not offend you. To have God's word and God's promises on your heart and your lips at such a time as this, not scrabbling around trying to say, oh, I wish I could remember something. How did how did the Lord my shepherd go? How did what what's after hallowed be thy name? That's some long distant memory. How sad if that's the way death and danger finds us. It's not the case with Jonah, and the scriptures just come tumbling out as he recalls and as he prays in the words of the Bible that he's so familiar with. And it's even what the Lord Jesus himself did on the cross. You might recall that uh, amongst his, his two uh, dying phrases, he's, one level he said, it is finished, and almost in the same breath, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. That's Psalm 31. That's Jesus quoting Psalm 31 and a, a, a wording that... Jewish people would often uh, speak and Jesus himself as he approaches the the gates of uh, death he quotes the words of the psalm we might well ask ourselves how well do I know my bible how well do I remember my bible have I, have I got anything of it in here maybe it's time to start learning maybe it's time to start studying maybe it's time to start meditating on it to make sure we're absorbing the truth of scripture that will be a, a cushion and a strength and a comfort, no matter what we're called on to go through life or even approaching death. Now is the time to start getting familiar with God's word, whether you already are or whether you know now I need to be. May God help us to, to do that. We'll uh, stop there for the time being and we'll sing again. Um, we're going to sing a... Uh, Lesser well-known, perhaps, him by John Newton, uh, the same John Newton that wrote Amazing Grace. Um, but he wrote many, many hymns. Um, this one is, is well-known to some. Uh, I asked the Lord that I might grow in faith and love and every grace. And it's, it's a hymn that talks about how he wants to, to know God better. He wants to experience more of God's goodness and grace. He imagines that that means blessing upon blessing being poured out upon him and instead he finds himself going through really hard times learning really hard lessons feeling blasted by God and when he queries God and says well, why uh, God says that's the way people grow that's that's in my mysterious providence that's me answering your prayer for more grace and more faith and these are lessons we, we need to learn so we're singing along with folks at the Together for the Gospel conference in Louisville, Kentucky, and we sing, uh, I ask the Lord, excuse me, I ask the Lord that I might grow. We sing to God's praise. I ask the Lord
Turn to, to Jonah. Uh, there he is, he's, he's drowning and he is uh, remembering passages of scripture and uh, calling out to the Lord his God. I uh, spoke last week about how between verses 3 and 6 um, we see Jonah talking about what he's going through at this point and his experience as he sinks beneath the waves and down towards the the bottom of the sea and he feels that the water's closing in and his life ebbing away uh, must have been a, a terrifying ordeal for him at the time he'd been thrown overboard by the sailors just as he'd asked them to do he said you know if you throw me into the sea the sea will quiet down for you back in in verse 12 and although they tried valiantly not to do that uh, by verse 15 they realized the storm's just getting worse and worse. So they picked up Jonah and hurled him into the sea and the sea ceased from its raging. Um, they did as he'd suggested and instructed and sure enough, the sea grew calm. These sailors threw him into the water. But see what he says here in, in verse 3. Uh, speaking to the Lord, he says, you cast me into the deep. He doesn't say they cast me into the deep, these men cast me into it. you cast me 
into the deep, into the heart of the seas and the flood surrounded me. It wasn't them that did it. It was, obviously, they were the instruments in God's hand. But what you can see is that this was the Lord who's behind it. It's his purposes that have been fulfilled. His purposes, his way for Jonah is what's transpiring in Jonah's life. Jonah knows whose hands he's in. He knows whose purposes are at work here. And he knows that he cannot run away from that God. If he ever thought it, he knows for sure now he can't. In all my foolishness, you've been there. Lord, you've been there. In, in, in my idiocy, in disobeying you and running away and seeking to think I could hide from the presence of the Lord. And yet, you've been with me all the way. You cast me into the sea and the flood surrounded me. And it's that same God that's going to deliver him now. This, this is actually the means of Jonah's deliverance. Um, this is not the means of his death. How thankful we should be to God. If we could only see with our eight eyes, if we could only see his hand, his purposes, his gracious doings in our lives, if we only knew the half of what he's done for us, how thankful, how grateful, we ought to be. How important to make this discovery that Jonah is making here. I'm in your hands. They threw me into the sea, but you threw me into the sea. I'm in your hands. And ultimately, that's where he's glad to be and where you and I should be glad to be. Because Jonah's not drowning here. He obviously feels to him as though he is, and he describes it there for us. Um, and this is obviously him writing with the benefit of hindsight afterwards, remembering that these were his thoughts and his words at that time. But Jonah's not drowning here. Jonah's not dying here. He, what Jonah's doing is surviving. Jonah's being preserved. Jonah has been saved by God right here in the midst of this experience. And if we were to almost like to reread um, verses three to six uh, with an alternative viewpoint, we'd maybe see it a different way altogether. You could say, picking up at verse 3, for you cast me into the deep, into the heart of the Lord, and your grace surrounded me. All your goodness and mercy passed over me. Then I said, I'm never away from your sight, and yet I shall look again upon your holy temple. The waters closed in over me to save my life. Your deep mercy surrounded me. Cords of love were wrapped around my head. By the king of the mountains, I was saved. I was felt I was going down to the land whose bars would close upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, securing my eternity. O oh Lord, my God. That's in reality, that's what's happening, isn't it? It's, it's very different. On a human level, he feels he's drowning and the waters are killing him. In actual fact, he, he's right there in the palm of God's hand and God is preserving his life at this moment. It's, it's, a, it's a complete uh, turnaround from what he really thinks is going on. Uh, and it just reminds us we see everything different if we could only see through God's eyes, through spirit-taught eyes. Uh, we'd have a new, a new understanding, uh, a new experience of God's goodness and God's grace. So that when we do come to these moments, whether we feel we're drowning literally or symbolically, whether we're like Moses and the Israelites standing at the Red Sea thinking, there's no way out of this, whether we're facing a Goliath like David, whether we're facing the lion's den like Daniel, whatever it is we're, we're meeting and we're facing, there's two ways of looking at it. There's the, the human terror and horror of, why am I in this situation? And there's the way of seeing it through the lens of scripture and saying, this is the, the will of God. This is the doing of God who does nothing wrong and whose purposes and plans are being worked out, not just in my life, but in the lives of those around me and in the cause of Christ in the world. Um, sometimes we can't see the point and possibly Jonah thought, what's the point of me dying here? Uh, I could have been so useful Maybe he's thinking that way, 
We can't see the point. Sometimes we can't see the point of what we're going through, but God can. And that, that is everything. That, that, should, that should be a huge comfort for us. You think of the, the book of Job, and Job goes through all the, the trials and troubles that he goes through. And maybe he's thinking, I can't see the point in this. Why is God putting me through this? But even we can see it as we look back on Job and we see the end of the story and we see what's going on. Things that Job, Job couldn't see at the time. We can see a bit more. And we see that God has his purposes and his plans in that story and what a comfort it's been for thousands over the, the years. And sometimes it might be for ourselves. Um, I don't, Job might, even when things became clear to him, he might think, well, what was the point in that? What did I really learn from that? But maybe it wasn't primarily what he was going to learn. Maybe it's what we were all going to learn. We Bible readers who have his story preserved for us, what we were going to learn over the years. Maybe there are things going on in another realm uh, that that we don't know why things play out on the earth the way they do. But in the angelic world, there may be massive repercussions from the things that are going on here in the world that we simply cannot see. And and there are there, there's a, a, a cosmic world out there in which it might be that the things that happen on earth, things that make us say, I don't know why this is happening to me. The answer may be in another realm altogether that we're yet to discover. Uh, on Thursday night at the prayer meeting, we spoke briefly about the, the end of Hebrews 11. We love the beginning, but it's by faith. Abraham did this, Moses did this, and all the great heroes and what they did. But it ends with those that were stoned and those that were killed for the gospel and those that suffered for the gospel and who lived in dens and caves of the earth and knew hardship and trial and suffering uh, for the cause of Christ. And it might be that those folks have thought, well, why are we having to go through this? Maybe they had giant question marks hanging over their lives. Why, if we're God's people, why, if he loves us, are we having to go through these things? But God has his purposes and Often it's for those that follow and the generations that follow what they can learn from it. Uh, we simply don't see things the way that God sees things. You think of the, the thief on the cross, the one that was saved at the last minute of his life. He must have thought, this is the worst day of my life. I'm going to die here in, on the cross. It was the best day of his life. It was the day he met Jesus. And if he hadn't been sent to be crucified, that simply wouldn't have happened. Or you think of Barabbas, who thought it was the best day of his life. This is the luckiest day of my life. I got released. That other guy's gone to the cross instead of me. Maybe it was the worst day of his life. It was the day he didn't meet Jesus. And maybe, for all we know, eternal life slipped through his grasp at that point. God knows what he's doing. We don't. We, we're called to trust. Jonah might feel he's dying here, but he's not. Jonah might feel his life is over, but it's not. Jonah might feel there is no point and purpose in me drowning at this time in this way. But yes, there was, and God is at work in Jonah's life, even there and then. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my uh, ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts says the Lord in Isaiah 55. Uh, and it's a, it's a bit perhaps like that hymn we sang, the John Newton hymn, I asked the Lord that I might grow. I wanted to, to be holier, I wanted to be stronger, I wanted to be mightier in the faith. And he answers me in a, a different way altogether, where we can't see the point of this illness. What's the point of this cancer? What's the point of this redundancy? What's the point of this... Um, bereavement? What's the point of this financial crisis I'm going through? What's the point of the troubles that have come upon my family? We can't see it. And maybe it's a bit like the old Footprints poem. It's only afterwards and you look back and you see how the Lord got you through, how he carried you according to the, the, the poem. But he brought you through, he delivered you. And it was those times that seemed the worst were the very times that he was closest to us doing things that perhaps we only ever see with hindsight, perhaps that we'll never see till eternity, but we trust in God. We trust he knows what he's doing.
And if Jonah does believe here that he's, he's dying, then at least he's dying with, with hope. Maybe he's even daring to believe that God is rescuing him. Once, once he stops sinking in the water and he's swallowed by this great creature, maybe, maybe he thinks, well, that's it, I'm really going now. Or maybe he thinks, this is God. This is the hand of God eh, rescuing me in some way. Did, might you then imagine that I'm, a, I'm immediately going to get... Um, out of here within the next few minutes. Um, I'm sure he wouldn't have realised it's going to be a whole three days yet before he gets out. But see how he speaks. I'm driven away from your sight, verse 4. Yet I shall again look upon your holy temple. Now, I suppose we can't tell. Is he thinking of the temple in Jerusalem? Or is he thinking of heaven? Um, it could be ambiguous at that point. Um, but he's, whatever it is, there's a hope. He's, he's not thinking, I'm dead and gone, I'm never going to see anything else ever again. He has a hope. And it comes out again between verses 6 and 9. Uh, yes, I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. When my life was fainting away, I remembered the Lord, and my prayer came to you into your holy temple. Those who pay regard to vain idols forsake their hope of steadfast love. And there he's thinking of folk that don't have his God and are praying and putting their hope in other gods and other things. Um, but I don't have that. Such people forsake their hope of steadfast love, but I have a different hope. And I, with a voice of thanksgiving, will sacrifice to you. What's he going to sacrifice inside the belly of a creature? What I have vowed I will pay. Salvation belongs to the Lord. And, and it, it, it's not a prayer that ends on a note of despair, it ends on this tremendous note of hope. Um, I, I will yet do all these things. I, I, you're bringing me up. I will sacrifice to you. I will uh, pay my vows and do what I've always promised I would do. There, there's no despair here in that sense in Jonah. You think of um, Dylan Thomas' famous poem about uh, go not quietly into that dark night speaking about death you know don't don't go limply and quietly into death but be angry that life is over and that human beings have to die go not quietly into that dark night but rage rage against the dying of the light but that's not jonah that's not jonah raging against the dying of the light this is not like job's wife saying to him, curse god and die just get this over with curse him and, and be done with um, it's not like the other thief on the cross who's taunting and mocking and ridiculing uh, Jesus right up to the last minute and uh, bitter and angry in the face of death. There's a totally different spirit here in Jonah where he's submitting himself to the Lord and he's, if he's dying, then he's dying with, with a hope. And maybe that hope even amounts to, I'm going to survive this God clearly. Has a purpose for me. We, we don't know what it is, but he, he, he can see clearly enough to see that there are others who don't have that hope in God, that they are trusting in false gods, in vain idols. They've put other things in the place of God. And he pities them. He pities them. Those who pay regard to vain idols, they're forsaking their hope of steadfast love. Maybe he's thinking of the sailors on the boat. He doesn't know they've been saved. Maybe he's thinking of the people of Nineveh and folk like that. And they don't know God. But at last, uh, there's this pity, there's this compassion in him that should have been there from the moment God told him to go and preach to Nineveh. And it wasn't there, and he ran away from it. And now it would appear that it's back. And he's pitying those who don't have uh, the, the true and living God to turn to. And whatever idols people have, and you might feel, well, I don't have an idol, I don't pray to any false God. But some people, the, Almost subconsciously, they're worshipping money. They're pursuing riches, materials, material things. As long as I'm comfortable, um, I don't, there's so little that I need. And sometimes here in the West in particular, we're so comfortable, we don't need God, or we think we don't. Jonah pities people like that. Vain idols 
trusting in that won't get us anywhere and won't deliver, but the true and living God will. And he says, I will thank that God. I will, I will, with the voice of thanksgiving, I will sacrifice to you. I will do the things I promised I would do. I will keep your word from now on. I will obey when your word, if it ever comes to me again. What's Jonah going to sacrifice in the belly of a whale yeah, or a sea creature? What, what is he going to sacrifice? Yeah, there's, there's nothing there that he can give up, is there? Until we remember Psalm 51, uh, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, uh, a broken and contrite heart, O oh God, you will not despise. That's the sacrifice the Lord looks from us. He doesn't want us to, to give him a sheep, a goat, a bull, uh, these kind of sacrifices. He wants to see that we're humble, that we're contrite, that we're repentant, that we're turning from our sins to embrace him. That's the sacrifice God's looking for. That's the sacrifice that Jonah is now making within the belly of the, the, the great fish. That's what he's doing. He's, he's a changing and changed man. He's ready now to come out. He sees that salvation is from the Lord. It's all about God. And that, that has to be the, that, that's what saved me. That's the only thing that can save others. And now that he's come to that point, he's, he's ready to come out. He's learned wisdom. We saw a couple of weeks ago that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and he's back there. He, he fears the Lord. He respects the Lord. He loves the Lord. He wants to be obedient to the Lord and put him first in his life, not his own wishes, his own comfort, his own running away from what he doesn't like. He's He's got a new wisdom. Uh, he's got a new perspective. He sees the grace of God there's a U-turn in his mind. We, we speak often in these days, don't we, about the, the government doing a U-turn. Well, there's a U-turn in, in Jonah's mind. He's transformed. He's seen things a different way from the Jonah that got onto the boat. And at the same time, God's doing a U-turn in his life. And the, the, the boat that had been sailing to, to Tarshish, well, maybe it carries on, but Jonah doesn't. He's heading back towards Joppa or wherever. Um, part of the land that he's going to be to be um, vomited out onto. Um, he's he's doing a U-turn. We saw these whales perhaps this week in the Gearloch, and uh, they're so hard to to turn around and get them to go where you want them to go. They're, they're trying to get them out to sea uh, to save their lives, but you know they don't want to go. Um, but this one does. This one does a U-turn by God's grace, and it's symbolic of the U-turn Jonah's doing. He's heading back uh, to the work that God's called him to do. He's a broken man. He's a changed man. He's a renewed man. He's a man who's now useful again in God's service, but he has nothing. He's got nothing at this point. He is nothing, and it's a tremendous realisation for him to realise, I've got nothing and I am nothing, and I just am at the mercy of God's grace. And that grace is poured out in abundance. It's perhaps it's almost symbolised in the in the vomit. You know, I'm sure it's a deliberately colourful verse here in verse ten. The Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah out upon the dry land. That's the kind of story the kids love. You know, it's just gooey and grotty, and you know it, it paints a really yeah, yucky, colourful, graphic picture of Jonah, who's utterly wretched at this point. He's filthy. But he's so aware now of what's what. He's wised up. He has pity and compassion in his heart for the lost. He's worshipful. He's humbled. He's thankful. He's had a complete U-turn and turn around. He's been turned upside down. He's been turned inside out. And he's ready as we pick up, uh, God willing, next time to start again. Uh, if God would ever be so gracious as to call him again. And just before we close, we remember again that this whole story is to remind us about Jesus. Jesus, who was three days and three nights in the gates of death and was released again, resurrected again. And we could even read the same passage again. And in Jonah's um, imminent death, you can see the imminent death of Jesus. You could, you could put Jesus into this passage and see him 
dying on the cross. He prayed to the Lord his God, not from the belly of the fish, but from the anguish of the cross. And so many of these experiences that John is going through, it's it's Jesus too as he sinks into death and the, the distress and anguish of his death comes upon him. And yet, of course, the hope is there because he knows why he's there and what he's doing. And salvation belongs to the Lord. That's what he is going through that whole experience for, because salvation is being worked for his people. And they will come to faith through this. And doesn't emerge from the belly of the fish. The Lord spoke to the stone at the door and Jesus walked out of the tomb. Death defeated and you and I um, you and I will never know what it was like to be on the cross I'm sure we'll never know what it is to be inside the belly of a fish but one day you and I will die one day every single one of us will die and we'll be where Jonah is at this point there, there will come a moment when our time comes to leave this world it might be sudden it might be drawn out but there'll come a point, and it might not be so far away, we just don't know, do we? And the, I suppose the question the passage raises for us, what will be on your heart at that time? What will be on your lips? What will be on your thoughts? What will be on your mind? Who will you be thinking about? Will you be dying in despair and hopelessness? Or will you be dying without looking forward to, to the Lord and his gracious purposes? And you could read this passage again and read it for yourself and put yourself into it. Because if you're a believer in Christ and you're trusting in him for your salvation, you can say that the believer prayed to the Lord, not from the belly of the fish, but from the gates of death. I called out to the Lord out of my distress and he heard me. And even as I was sinking into the, the waters of death and even as I was going down to the depths, I could still see the hand of God and I could still see and hope in his salvation. Salvation is from the Lord. Will I sacrifice to him? Will I pay my vows to him? Will I trust in him? Because then for such a person, the Lord, verse 10, doesn't speak to the, the fish who vomits us out on the dry land. The Lord spoke to death and to the grave and said, let them go. And they gave up the believer into the arms of the Lord forever. That's where we want to be. That's where we need to be. That's where you and I need to be on the day we die. Read it for yourself. Make this a blessing to yourself by taking it, personalising it to yourself. Pray as Jonah prayed. Pray as Jesus prayed. Know that salvation is from the Lord. Be ready, because that time will come. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for uh, bringing these things to our notice, uh, enabling us to, to learn from the life of Jonah, to learn uh, especially from the life of Jesus, who has defeated death and, and hell and the grave and sin for his people, so that we need never uh, experience these things. We pray, prepare us for the day we meet you face to face. May we be found ready rather than unready. Be gracious to us, we pray, for Jesus' sake. Amen. And our closing praise is to sing of God's grace. Uh, your grace that leads this sinner home from death to life forever and sings the song of righteousness by blood and not by merit. We sing along with City of Light uh, down in Australia. We sing to God's praise.
grace that reaches far and wide to every tribe and nation has called my heart to enter in the joy of your salvation by grace I brings us to the end of our service for today. Uh, thank you for listening. Thank you for being with us. And we do pray that uh, the Lord himself would bless to our hearts these words. Um, God willing, we'll see you again next week. Uh, we remember that there are those that are able to be in the church building and those who are not. If you're able to, to join with us there, then do please be in touch. Let us know by Thursday and uh, we'll see about getting your space adding you to the rota for future space uh, we're of course at this time we're not allowed to go into other people's houses um, but we can still meet in cafes so if you want to, to meet me or one of the elders in a cafe get in touch with us and uh, we're never reluctant to have a cup of tea or coffee with friends so do um, do speak to us in that way and we can carry on um, doing pastoral work being friends in the gospel, helping one another in that way. So the notices will follow uh, and they are all God willing. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Amen. <laughs>